Slavery, it used to be legal everywhere and practiced everywhere. In the 21st century, it's illegal, but guess what? It's still practiced everywhere. Next, we'll talk to a man who's been there, who's lived a slave's life. This program was made possible by funding from the UCF Global Perspectives Office. Hello and welcome to the Global Perspective Show. I'm John Bercia, Special Assistant to the President for Global Perspectives at the University of Central Florida. Our topic today is human trafficking, an issue that many of us are not that familiar with. It's been called slavery, it's been called by other names. It's a very prevalent problem in the world of the 21st century. Our guest today is Francis Bach. Uh, he's a man who's lived the issue. He's a former slave from Sudan. Today he's an abolitionist and the author of a book, The First Contemporary Slave Narrative, Escape from Slavery. Welcome, Mr. Bach. Thank you, it's an honor to be here. Thank you for joining us. Well, why don't we start at the beginning? Tell us how all of this started for you, uh, where you were as a child when your world suddenly changed. This horrible story of mine and the story of my people, uh, in my um, generation, it started when I was a young boy, seven years old, in 1986. That was the time I was sent by my mother to go to a local um, marketplace where these angry uh, fundamentalist Arabs and Islamists, Arab Bagara, or Arab ginger wheat, came and stormed the market and they killed the man brutally. I watched the men and women would kill around me. And that day, I became a victim of slavery. I was taken up to northern Sudan, where I served the northern Sudanese militiamen has his property. Where well, well, tell us, and, and how were you transported from your village up to northern Sudan? Well, after they destroyed, this militiamen destroyed and killed the man, in particular, the marketplace, and also stealing our livestock. Um, and rounding up all the women and children. And, and just to be clear, when I mention women, it's not randomly every kind of women. They only select the women that are still physical and strong. And the old one, they abandoned them. So we were taking up to the north and the young kids who cannot walk, because it's a very long walk, they um, actually put them on the donkeys. Uh, and um, I was actually uh, riding uh, donkey along with other kids. Uh, we were put in a sort of a basket. I don't know how to describe it, the best description I could give. Um, and, and that's how I made it to northern Sudan and spending next 10 years uh, serving um, the militiamen who participated himself on, the, uh, on that uh, raiding. Well, tell us, uh, early on you tried to escape. What, what was the result of that Well, attempt? I first... I first attempted to escape, and this is uh, seven years after I was taken to that village. And I have learned that I was completely uh, dehumanized. Um, I was uh, actually um, denied not even to be around people. I was forced to sleep with the animals, near to the animals. And I was in shock or surprise with the animals that they have because my people, the Dinka tribes, are the cattle people. And my own family, my father, has actually earned a lot of cattle. But I was actually shocked how the young, you know, boy, like my age, seven years old, being actually put far away from the people, nobody even guiding him, nobody even uh, mentoring him. So, and I knew I was in the wrong place with the wrong people. So I decided to skip. And it was a very hard decision for me to make because I was too young at the time and I didn't know my way where to go. Because when I was brought into that community uh, seven years before I first attempted, I was too young. And uh, I didn't know the language they speak because they speak Arabic and I speak Dinka, which is my native language. However, I attempted to run away early one morning because I'm the first one to walk up in the morning and I'm the last one to go to bed. 
That was my life routine. So one of the morning, I don't know, I assume might have been four in the morning or three a.m. in the morning, and I ran away, and my master cousin was watching over me. So he returned me home, and I was beaten, and I was threatened not to escape again by a machine gun. And and but you did, you you escaped I did. again. I did. I actually after I was uh, captured back the first day, I waited for two days, and I said to myself, I would rather die than being slave because I hate the way they treat me and also the way they treat other slaves. And I have witnessed other slaves, both boys and girls, being treated the same way. And the worst one that I actually made my mind to run away from these people, I knew that one day they will hurt me. They will torture me because there was a boy who just uh, neighboring us, who actually working with a cousin of my master, who one day refused to go after the camels. Um, his master, one of the richest guy in the area with the camels, and the boy was sick. They could see it and smell it. But he was not given that chance to stay home. So he told his master, I'm not going to do this work today. And with that, you know, uh, not actually listening to his master, his master said he's lazy. And what he did was he cut off his left leg. He said, we will make you stay home. And that's how they tortured that young man. And I was brought to that house, particularly to see and to be eyewitness what may possibly happen to me if I actually resisted or refused not to uh, do what my master actually commanded me to do. And, and that's what I said to myself. It, it wouldn't be matter how long I will be with these people or serving them or do what. They were still not going to appreciate all that I do or even um, recognizes uh, me or one day free me and treated me equally like other human being or like them. So you escaped again and that also failed. So the second term, I, I call it, it, it just, uh, I, I think it's the God who saved me uh, that day, is a God who uh, probably told him not to kill me. Because the second attempt, uh, it was one of the most dangerous one. It wasn't dangerous at the time I left, because I left about the same time at the first one in the morning. But my master was very curious and very cautioned uh, after my first attempt. So he allowed me to walk about a mile uh, from the house. And then he got on his horse. And this horse, he doesn't ride this horse except only on the special occasion important occasion because this is one of the fastest and the strongest horse that he has. So he got on that horse and he took his gun with him. When he came near me, he told me stop and lie down on my chest and give him my hand and my leg behind me. And with the rope, he actually tied me and I would drag home. That day, I thought that was going to be um, the day he would kill me. And he actually said it. After I was brought home, he said, today is your last day on the earth. Uh, and I remember his wife, her name's Hawa. And, and this is really, uh, it made me think about what such a horrible woman she was. Because she was saying to him, Why, what are you waiting for? Why can't you just shoot him? Or let me just kill him like a chicken. Or call my brother or even my son, Ahmed, to shoot him. But I was saying, why she hated me? She has children. And uh, during that moment, when Juma was standing, Juma is my former master, standing in front of me, and his gun was loaded and ready to shoot me, I just, I just closed my eyes and said, God, don't let him kill me. I have hope in the future. And I also said, I love my parents. I want to see them again. And during that moment, I don't know what happened. I think Juma left, and I was left tied up. Uh, for several hours, and I thought that I would never walk again normally. But thank God that uh, all the wounds and all the uh, injuries that I got from the tied up, the long tied up, uh, yield, and I'm today walking in my own feet and uh, healthier. There's a lot of scars I still have in my leg, but I survived. That second attempt made me wait for three long years again.
And then the third time you succeeded. So the third time is uh, three years later, which was uh, 1996. I was 17 years old that time. And, and that time I, I actually decided with determination and, uh, and also uh, saying to myself, I'm not a seven years old anymore. I'm, I'm a grown up man and I think I could resist and fight back if anybody captured me because I want my freedom. I want to go back and live my life. I came from the family who loves me, who always come to me every morning and every evening before I go to bed. We love you. Who cares for me? And, and I can't be in this situation anymore. So my third attempt was very successful. Uh, God has really guided me and uh, delivered me um, until I made my way to another town called Motari. And with the help of the truck driver, and by the way, this is very important here because the truck driver that I'm about to describe, he's a Northern Sudanese and he's a Muslim. His name is Abdurrahman. And he actually took me first to his house and I stayed with him for two months. The same man actually paid for my bus ticket or loader tr ticket um, rather to make my way to the capital city of Sudan, Khartoum. I was in refugee camps called Jaburana in, uh, in Khartoum, where I would help again by the southern Sudanese and particularly for my tribe uh, through black market and making my way to Egypt uh, early 1988, uh, taking a train from Sudan to Sudan and Egypt border in a place called Aswan, uh, excuse me, uh, uh, Alpha. And from Alpha, I took uh, a boat towards Red Sea to Egypt to Aswan and then taking another train, uh, I don't know how two of them, and eventually end up in Cairo. And when I first end up in Cairo, I, I didn't even know where to stay and who to stay with because I didn't have family member and I didn't know anybody. And, and I was like just street boy. Everyone sees me, particularly when I arrive at, the, uh, at one of the busiest um, city in Cairo, in Tahrir, uh, the train stations. Uh, everyone sees me and they thought I was a street boy because I didn't have bag, I didn't have anything not even nice clothes on. And finally, I was taken uh, by a taxi driver to one of the church that accommodates um, the new arrivals, Southern Sudanese and others who come to Egypt and without having family and money to pay their own rent. So I spent 22 days in one of the Catholic church called uh, Sikakini in Abbasia, uh, Cairo, until I was actually uh, invited to stay one of the family and this person who invited me to come and stay with him is one of the leader in my community. It's, it's a man that I call him my father at the time. He was living in a two-bedroom apartment with his 13 children and wife. So you can imagine how kind this person um, you know is and uh, he his name Pio Tim. I stayed with him in Cairo and I remember I and his uh, seven boys, we share either balcony or in, 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 in some small aisle and uh, living room. This is where our blankets, you know, where we sleep and lay down. And it's a very hard situation, but we survived there until um, I went to United Nations uh, and I presented my case there, like other re immigrants who applied for refugee status. And it took me another year and a half until I was granted that opportunity to be resettled to USA uh, and, and to Fargo, North Dakota in late of 1999. So then you, you came here and, and, and then began a new chapter in your life. You were no longer a slave in Sudan. You were a free person in the United States. And you decided that you immediately wanted to get into the work of exposing this problem and talking about what had happened to you. So you became an abolitionist and you are an abolitionist to this day. Now you were in Fargo, North Dakota, and then you lived somewhere else in the Midwest, in Kansas for a while. Actually, when I, I first came, I was, yes, indeed, in Fargo, North Dakota, and then in May of 2000, uh, you know, 1-1-2000, one, one, uh, I actually decided to move to uh, Iowa. Not actually, I didn't decide it. I didn't even chose, I chose Iowa blindly. I didn't even know because I was struggling with the weather mm. in the Midwest, particularly in Fargo, North Dakota. And I would tell my sponsor, Barry Nelson, with the Lutheran Social Services, 
that I'm not happy. I'm very happy that I have actually uh, made it to this country, that now I'm living my life in the way that I can live. But I want to be around the people that I could communicate with them because I don't speak English when I first came to this country. So they mentioned four major cities. They mentioned Iowa because they have a lot of South Sudanese population in Iowa. And they mentioned also uh, Houston, Texas uh, and Phoenix, Arizona. And I just said Iowa. I have no idea what I was choosing. <laughs> and I thought the, 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 the weather climate will be actually different but better than in Fargo. But unfortunately, uh, I ended up in Iowa, but the good news is when I actually went to Iowa, I got to reunite with the family that used to help me in Egypt. Mm -hmm. And I stayed with them, and they got me a job at the meat company, and I got a job also at the uh, hotel. I was working two jobs, uh, except only Sunday, the day that I request for my laundry and also to cook for myself and to visit some uh, neighbors. Uh, until May of that year, of 2000, I actually was invited uh, by the modern-day abolitionist group in Boston called American Anti-Slavery Group. And I came to Boston to visit what they were doing, and I was very much moved and inspired and so appreciative to Dr. Charles Jacobs, whom I called my American father, who then convinced me with the work that they have done on, my be on, on behalf of my people, uh, advocating uh, the issue of slavery in Sudan and globally. So I thought, I said that if someone who's not a Southern Sudanese and not a Sudanese could be so concerned, so committed, so dedicated, why not me? I told Charles Jacobs that, Charles, I don't have what it takes, maybe now, but I hope one day I will have an opportunity to share my story, and that story will inspire people, educating them about what happening in my country because over two millions, including my own biological parents, were killed during that war. And yet, the international community turned their back on us, and yet there's no action being taken. And this is the time for me, I will use my freedom here to help free my people. I said to Charles, what is good my freedom if my people are still dying? What is good my freedom if my people are still in slavery? So I decided um, going back to Iowa and giving two, two week notice to both my work. And I told them that I'm actually quitting. I quit those two jobs and I moved to Boston in May of 2000, May 14, and I since then started speaking locally in Massachusetts at churches, at middle school and high school and colleges, and including um, having a panel on uh, about slavery at the Kennedy School of Government, Harvard University, and uh, widely spreading all over the U.S., including North America. So it, it has been really a, a great opportunity, and by the way, it was really a right choice for me. I started my abolitionism in the city that very famous of that nature because Boston, Massachusetts is actually a central of abolitionism. And I was so proud that I started my abolition in that city and to be a part of this um, uh, historic uh, work that I do on behalf, not only on behalf of the people of South Sudan, but on behalf of all humankind. So today, uh, do you feel that there is more awareness about the problem? or? people and non-governmental groups and governments working harder to address and diminish the problem of slavery? Um, I would say yes. I would say yes, and I will say yes, particularly because of the, the, reason, um, the reason opportunity for my people that gives me big smile and a lot of optimism of the future, brightest future that ahead of us. That, that uh, awareness that I have done and the modern day abolitionist groups, like American and Savior groups, Sudan Sunrise, and many other organizations out there who are doing good things, um, had actually educated American public and American government. And it really pressured the government in particular to make a different decision that will lead into a lasting peace in my country. 
And I will use my country as an example, and the champion of this, because we actually manage it. After all this, and, and I'm not talking in slavery, in particular, uh, I was actually disappointed uh, from our both governments, the South Sudan government and the Northern government, when they actually uh, accorded the, the comprehensive peace agreement in Navajo, Kenya in 2005. They did not mention anything about slaves. They did not mention about those still held in bondage, whether they will be released. And I, and I, and I doubted even they will be released by the captors because they're the resource for them. They're the one that work for them as cheap laborers. There's no way you will give up the cheap laborers, someone who can actually farm for you for free, cultivate and do whatever that they do for them. But I'm so happy that there are some other barriers that they're able to um, come together as a people, and that is the referendum. The referendum would just um, uh, get my people to determine and to choose their own future fate, which my people, both in eight countries in diaspora and at home in Sudan, both south and the north, had overwhelmingly uh, chose or voted in favor of uh, self-determination which lead to the highest uh, percentage of 98.83% uh, uh, in favor of independent country. And now the world has the newest nation that joining in that will- uh, The new country of the South Sudan. The new country of South Sudan, we are, we are so Committee. happy. And we, and the struggle continue. It struggle continue for those who are still yet to be free People like myself could never, you know, lay back and say I'm free at less and, until everyone is free because I know I'm speaking as a victim. I'm speaking as someone who had experienced this thing that I'm talking. I'm a living proof. And I don't know how many uh, former slaves are still out there. And, and this is something that gives me a great pride and an opportunity to, to represent millions of men and women who are still uh, held in bondage and and still traffic in all these nations who make every little sacrifice to live their own small property and come to America with the better promise and the future and some end up being slave, technically. And this is why the, the definition of slavery is so abroad. There are many ways that people can be easily uh, slave in this country. And human trafficking has actually dedicated that those you know, who are in slavery in the U.S., those who come and work for no pay under the threat of violence. And you can actually term that, because that's what it is. I was actually taken from my village to northern Sudan, working for no pay under the threat of violence. And the same thing happened to many women in prostitution. This is the thing that we as the people must address them and must make sure that they are being addressed by our governments. But it's, it, in the end, it's all for servitude. You don't have the choice of leaving. You don't have the choice of saying no. And, um, you know, th these have really become disposable people, as one of the abolitionists has, has coined the term. Um, now that you've been working as an abolitionist for a decade, do you feel that um, the, the possibilities are good for 10, 20, 30 years from now that we will begin to uh, decrease the presence of slavery in the world, that, that we, we can actually move in the direction of eradicating the problem once and for all? Um, I, I would say, John, there's no permanent situation on this planet. There is absolutely no permanent situation. Everything subject to change. Why can't it be changed? I think we are making progress already. If the people of Mauritania in Northern Africa are able to abolish and radically slavery once and for all some years ago, why can't it be also in Sudan? If the people of the United States made it through the civil rights, but was led by the late uh, Euro, the son of this country, Dr. Martin Luther King, who fought for civil rights. Slavery was abolished and eradicated in this country in 1865. Today, this country better off, despite some other uh, little things that are still going on, it is better off than before. It, we are actually making progress and we are actually decreasing it. And, and can be decreased if we all actually 
speak up for it and say, this is wrong. We have to acknowledge it first, it is wrong. No man, no woman, no child, nobody deserves to be treated or dehumanizing and enslaved. We all deserve to live as we all wish to live and be who God created us to be. Yes. So we cannot uh, overpower and overlook and actually treat others less than us. I like to be treated like the way you want to be treated. And I should respect your dignity so we all can live together in peace and harmony and prosperity that each of us respect other. So yes, we're making progress. The people like Dr. Bell, uh, Kevin Bell was Disposable People, the wonderful book that actually exposed a lot of about slavery. And, uh, and many other heroes out there has stated clearly, and that now our State Department here in the United States been reporting yearly about this. And I think that already gives uh, a chance of change. Because when people are aware more about this, they actually talk about their communities. They make a difference. They pressure their uh, authorities um, and those in the, in the governing authorities. And they, they make a difference. They, they eradicate. So I see some progress. And I, I'm so proud that the, my new nation that's coming will be free out of this will be free, will be just because we are going to adapt the Western democracies. We are going to definitely strict into that because... Yeah. Well, on that note, let me thank you. We appreciate having you today, Francis Bach. Thank you. And thank you for the Global Perspective Show. I'm John Garcia. We'll see you next time. This program was made possible by funding from the UCF Global Perspectives Office.